What's up, Oklahoma fans? This is Matt Hofeld from Crimson and Cream Machine here with Toby Rowland, the voice of the Sooners. Going to talk to us just a little bit today about the 2012 Oklahoma football team. But before we go there, I just want to ask you, I mean, here we are. We're standing in the stadium. You, yeah. you see the field behind us. You grew up a fan of this football team and a fan of the, of the university in general. What is it like for you now? You've finished your first year as the voice of the Sooners. Talk about that a little bit, a dream come true for you. You know, I'm 38 years old now, and it's still, every time I walk into this venue, it's cathedral type for me. Even today when we walked in, my boys are with me, and you can't help but stop and kind of look around. And, you know, I mean, this is one of the holy places of college football. Right. And especially if you grew up a Sooner fan, this place is awesome. Right. And so the last year has been, I've used the phrase dream come true so much that I, I feel like I need to come up with a better way to explain it. But it really is. I mean, this is getting to have that place, that press box be your office yeah. on Saturdays and to look out over 85,000 people and uh, Notre Dame's going to be here this year and the games that unfolded last year. It's, it's been pinch yourself incredible. It's really been great. Now you, uh, your first year, uh, with football, you got uh, you got to go to Tallahassee, yeah. call the Florida State game. You were in the Cotton Bowl when the Sooners just blew out Texas. Then uh, basketball, you had the Big 12 experience with the tournament in Kansas City. You got to call games in the uh, NCAA baseball tournament. Yeah. Kind of what were some of the highlights for you over your first year? You know, one thing that jumps out at me is right around Christmas time, we had uh, a basketball game in Cincinnati. Then we uh, got on, and that was on a Thursday night, I believe. We got on a 5 a.m. plane and headed out to Tempe to do the bowl game. Right. And then that night after the game actually got on a plane and flew back uh, to do a noon basketball game back here in Norman. So we did three games in three time zones in, I think, 42 hours, something like that. And it was awesome. I mean, that was like, this is what, this is what you do this for, to get to uh, fly around the United States and, and cover the Sooners. But, I mean, you mentioned a few of the high points. Tallahassee was incredible. That atmosphere was was unbelievable. Uh, the OU Texas game I've been to obviously several times, but to have that vantage point and for the Sooners to play as well as they did last year was great. I'll tell you, I think the game that I enjoyed calling the most was actually a loss. Uh -oh. I thought the Baylor game right. in Waco, and I listened to it back this week because I'm kind of studying for the upcoming season. From the first possession of that game until the very last pass was an incredible football game. And I don't know if you remember the second play of the game, Baylor actually threw an 80-yard touchdown pass that got called back. And it was foot to the, you know, pedal to the metal go from the second play of the game, four hours worth of catch your breath. Mm -hmm. And they lost, unfortunately. But I remember coming away that night going, holy cow, what a football game. So that was a lot, that was a lot of fun to be involved with. And, Lon Kruger was the greatest. Um, Sonny Galloway is so fun to work with and interview. Sonny, uh, you never have a bad interview with Sonny because he always comes up with interesting answers for everything that you ask. So uh, it was a great year all around. Now, would you, uh, would you say that uh, maybe uh, Baylor was that the most intense moment of the football season last year? Well, there was so much on the line in that game. I mean, the national championship was still at stake, and simultaneously USC was beating Oregon at the time, which would have put Oklahoma back in the picture had they won that night. So that, I mean, that was pretty, and the comeback and the belldozer and the, the way that it ended, that was a pretty amazing night, just as far as a game that goes right down to the wire. The Florida State game was exciting, and it was a fourth quarter decision, and they tied it up, and. Uh, Landry had to hit that pass to Kenny Stills to win it there at the end. So those are probably the two games that jump out as far as edgier seat tension field drama. All right, so you're looking at, at this football season. Yeah. A lot of big names have coming out. Uh, a lot of the, absolutely relying on new uh, receivers, some of them freshmen, some of them junior, junior college guys. We saw Trey McTwire in the spring. Mm -hmm. uh, from what I hear, everything in summer camp, he's exactly what we had in the spring. But highlight some of the new guys that Oklahoma is going to rely on, whether they're okay. freshmen or guys that are just the first-year starters like uh, R.J. Washington. So who are some guys that have kind of caught your eye so far? You know, I think that the question that I had and you had and Sooner fans had this summer was the wide receiver position. And I, my impression here two weeks away from kickoff is that they're going to be fine at wide receiver. I, I feel, and in fact, I think they're going to be more than, I think that's going to be one of the strengths of this team, the way that it has pieced together with Justin Brown joining the team from Penn State. McTwire, I still haven't seen him drop a pass wow. in the spring and in the fall. 
Kenny Stills, we know the big play possibilities he has. Then you throw in some new guys who I think are going to instantaneously help them, like Shepard, like Neal, Roy Finch in the slot. Uh, Gino Grissom at tight end is a guy who I think is going to play, and I think he's going to be a factor on the offensive side too. So I think the wide receiver position has gone from a big-time question mark to an area that will be one of the strengths on this team, and especially when – uh, and if Jazz and Trey are able to join the fray on down the line. Defensive end is a place where R.J. Washington, you mentioned, David King, guys like Chuka and Dule who have played but haven't played a lot. They're really high on uh, Charles Tapper, the freshman, and Onahu from uh, Edmund Santa Fe. I think those are two freshmen who look really good and are going to have a chance to play right away at the defensive end position. Defensive backfield, I think, is going to be a strength. Not a lot of new faces back there. Linebacking core, you may see some guys like uh, Frank Shannon play a little more, who's been in the program but hasn't seen a lot of playing time. And then the running back, uh, the Juco kid, Damian Williams, I think has a chance to be exciting. And depending on how Dominic Whaley comes along with his um, recovery process, he may play early and may play a lot. He's, he's pretty talented. A couple of guys that you mentioned on the offensive side of the ball, uh, Grissom at tight end, you, you said he's looking pretty good. You see him playing. Is he more of a blocking style tight end to help enforce the run game who can slip out every now and then on a on a you know block and then release for yeah. a, a short pass pattern? Or is he a guy that can hit the seam? I think that, first off, he's a tremendous athlete. It's fun to see 85 on the offensive side of the ball in a uniform again. Because right. when you see 85, you go, Ryan Broyles Absolutely. came back. No, yeah. he's, he's about a foot taller than Ryan <laughs> Broyles. He's a tremendous athlete. And when you see him in a uniform on the offensive side of the ball, he looks like a tight end. I think that obviously with his background as a lead blocker, either out you know, um, helping wide receivers or in the backfield or however, I think that's going to be his strength. But he's got good hands. He's got surprisingly good hands. So I think that they're not going to be afraid to throw him the football. So the other guy, we talked about Grissom, the other guy you mentioned was Whaley. Everyone wants to know, how does Whaley look? Is he healthy? Is he, is he making cuts? Is he sharp? You know, I think the jury is going to be out. Yeah, he looks good. I don't think we will know completely on Dominique maybe until a game or two has gone by because obviously they want to bring him along slowly. They don't want to uh, put too much stress on him, hit him too much in the, until they feel – I think everybody's dealing with a confidence issue there. And so, I, you know, we'll see. I think he's going to have to go play at Texas El Paso and Florida Atlantic, and then we'll all get together and evaluate, is he back to 100% or maybe even better than he was before, or is he obviously slowed by the injury? So I, it's, that's probably going to be something we're going to have to revisit in a month or so. So at El Paso, uh -huh. put you on the spot here. Uh, OU, let's say they, they received the kickoff. Tell me the first three receivers that are going to try it on the field. I think your starters will be uh, Kenny Stills, Trey Matwire, and Justin Brown. Okay. Let's switch sides to the defensive side of the okay. ball. How's Aaron Colvin looking at corner? Aaron Colvin is, I mean, he's an NFL talent. I, I think their defensive backfield with Tony Jefferson now at the back is it goes from probably the weakness of this team a year ago or at least what everybody complained about the most because they got beat deep to the strength. Uh, Jefferson and Javon Harris, Jefferson definitely an NFL type talent. Demontre Hurst and Aaron Colvin, I think both will be NFL type guys. So, and then Gabe Lynn comes in then as your nickelback, where I think he will fit in more comfortably than maybe how they've tried to use him in the past. He will end up being matched up against not speedy wide receivers necessarily, but running backs and tight ends or some slot guys. So I think that, I mean, that looks like a pretty solid unit. And Aaron Colvin, who you asked about, may be the best that they have of that unit. In your, in your opinion, we, you know, two names you mentioned, Harris and, and Gabe Lynn, two mm -hmm. guys that everybody remembers. Uh, Lynn struggled against Texas Tech right. here last year. Gabe Lynn, or no, yeah, Gabe Lynn struggled against Texas Tech here. Harris, uh, the, everybody remembers the, the Baylor game that you right. mentioned. Was that schematics? Was that learning their job or was it a little bit of both? You know, you'd have to ask one of the defensive coaches to be sure. Um, I think it's probably a little bit of both. I think you got to get the right guys in the right place, and sometimes even if you do that, a guy reads a play wrong and he gets beat. The one thing that you got to remember about Javon Harris is he has been a, uh, a goat on occasions in his career because it's real easy to be. You get beat once deep, and that's all anybody remembers. Javon Harris has made some big plays for this team. Sure. Two interceptions in that Florida State game. They needed those two plays. He played very well in relief against Oklahoma State two years ago. I think Javon Harris is a big play type guy. 
if he can feel comfortable in the defense, and that's what Mike Stoops is trying to make him do. And the same with Gabe Lynn. Gabe Lynn likes to hit people. Right. And so getting him closer around the line of scrimmage in that nickel back or even sliding him down once in a while and kind of hiding him as a linebacker I think will fit what he likes to do the most. Yeah, you'll remember that hit against Ball State last sure. year. Sure, yeah. Gabe Lynn, you know, took the guy's helmet off. The guy's off. helmet's still out there <laughs> on the field, I think. Okay, so on defensive side of the ball, if you had to say this is their strength, this is their weakness, what would you pick? Oh, uh, I think the strength is the defensive backfield right now. I think this is a ball-hawking, playmaking, interception-grabbing defensive backfield led by a guy with a lot of swagger in Tony Jefferson. You got one at the back, and suddenly everybody feels better about the situation, and everybody kind of carries themselves with a little bit of attitude because Tony carries himself right. with a little bit of attitude. The rest of it I think we're going to have to see. I think the defensive ends – are going to be really good. They just haven't had a chance to play a lot. I mean, David King's probably played the most of that group. R.J. Washington, when he had a chance last year, made plays, got a lot of sacks. Had a good bowl game. Had a good bowl game. Chuka Ndule, when he's had a chance to play, has played well. And these new kids, I'm, I'm telling you, Tapper and Anoha, they're going to get a chance to play, and I think that's going to end up being a unit that uh, is going to be better than people anticipate. Uh, linebackers, I think, will be solid. We know what Wart can do. We know what Nelson can do. Uh, Ibaloye will play there, obviously. Shannon's a guy who's going to get a lot of runs. So uh, I don't know what I'd say the weakness would be. I, that's, I, I'll say this. They haven't had a difference maker at defensive tackle in a couple of years. You know, they had that great run with Tommy Harris and Dusty Dvorak and Gerald McCoy, a guy who demanded a double team. And they need somebody to become that for this team, whether it's McFarlane or McGee. Um, or whoever it would be, they need a defensive tackle to really be a guy that you have to scheme around. It's safe to say that uh, Notre Dame is the home game you're most anticipating? Yeah, I mean, that's going to be an incredible day uh, just to see those helmets on this field with the history between those two programs. And the history between those two programs on this field right. is going to be, I think that's the game that everybody is looking forward to, but Oklahoma State's coming here this right. year. That's going to be first time since the first time in a long time. Yeah, so two thousand what was it? Two thousand and nine. Yeah, we yeah, uh, yeah the, Oklahoma's gone there two straight years. Right. So uh, that's going to be a fun game. Kansas State here. I mean, they're all fun to me right. at this point in my career. So, but Notre Dame's the game that that's going to be hard to sleep on Friday night. I think what makes uh, you know what made Bob Barry great was he was, I, the times I got to meet him, he was one of the nicest guys in the whole world, and he, yeah. he enjoyed what he did. And you see that in you. And when you listen to your broadcast, um, the thing I think that makes you really good at what you do, and, and one of the things I enjoy listening to you about, and I've talked to you about this, is you're a fan. I mean, above all else, you're a fan. Right. And, and that comes through in your voice, good and bad. Um, so as a fan, let, let's remove you from, not the sideline reporter, not the play-by-play -play guy. Okay. What's your greatest memory in this stadium? First game I ever came to was with my dad. And we sat in this end zone. We're in the south end zone, probably about 20 rows up from where we are right now, section 37. And it was a bedlam game. And Oklahoma killed them that day. 63 nothing, I believe, was the final. I'll have to go check the record book. But that was my first introduction to Sooner football. And I remember just leaving that day going holy cow and I don't think I ever missed a game either on the radio or in person somehow on television since then so um, that one is emblazoned on me I always remember where we sat and I remember the, the, I remember being with my dad mm -hmm. and not knowing when when we got up that day what we were in store for we were just going to a football game I had no idea and when we left the stadium that day I go that was that was something else that was something special and that was kind of the start of it all for me all right, it's Toby Rowland, the voice of the Sooners. You can catch him uh, every morning, uh, AM 1400 KREF, and, well, uh, also you can catch him every game day, whether it's football, baseball, or basketball, calling the Sooners. Toby, thanks for your time. Appreciate My pleasure. You thanks, time Matt. With this. Check us out at crimsonandcreammachine.com. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel.